Good morning. My name is Dave Rudy. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. We are glad you are with us this morning at First Unitarian of Oakland. We are committed to becoming an intentionally multi-generational, multiracial, multicultural, inclusive, and anti-oppressive religious community. You are welcome here. If you are new here, we invite you to fill out an orange newcomer card that can be found at the greeters table in the, at the welcome table in Venti Hall during coffee hour. You may also fill out the card online. There's a link to our website, to it on our website. Doing this helps us to help you explore what our community offers and to find ways to participate. That means you get the weekly chalice chatter, which gives you an idea what's going on. You can drop the card in the offering basket, forget that, and, or leave it at the welcome table after the service in Venti Hall. Or you can hand it to Emily Stoper. Is Emily? There she is back there doing the slides who will be holding a 10-minute orientation for newcomers at the end of today's service. Look for Emily down in front of the pulpit to answer your questions. Welcome, everyone. After service today, from 12.30 to 1.30 in the Star King Room, which is the room up through the hallway there, some of our church members will host a remembrance and healing space named Voicing Refugee. Forget that. Next, next, next week's a preview. And voicing refuge, speak and record the names of World War II Japanese American internees. We are all invited to gather and contribute our voices to the Erie Project, which is an online audio memorial of the 125,000 Japanese Americans held in internment camps solely on the basis of race. And again, that's next week. So come back and be part of that and get your voice to be part of that recording. This week, there are two church events that all are invited to. This Friday at 7 p.m., the Earth Justice Associates are co-hosting a screening of the documentary Silent Fallout. The film director will be here. We'll also be having popcorn. Mark your calendars. The Declutter Project's Saturday workday has been rescheduled to August 10th. That's next Saturday. We will start at 10.30 a.m. and work for two hours and then celebrate our work with pizza. Molly Hermes from our dedicated finance team will lead volunteers in sorting documents into keep, recycle, and shred boxes to make our church's fire safety goal a reality. And that will happen in Venti Hall next Saturday morning. Please connect with these ministries during the coffee hour if you have any questions. Lastly, today we have about 30 special guests from the YRUUP, our Young Religious Unitarian Universalists of the Pacific, joining us again during the service. YRUUP is a youth-led UU organization, and our church had the opportunity to host their overnight summer conference this weekend. Last week, we hosted the, their council retreat. Please join me in welcoming them to the podium to share a bit about their weekend and organization. Do we have someone coming up telling us? We have a volunteer, okay. Hello, apologies. I did not know I was going to be talking about our organization. I believe the person who was is just not here today. Um, also, I am very tired and I have not changed, but it's fine. So we are YRUP, we are a youth-led nonprofit UU organization that hosts events for youth ages 14 to 20 with adult advisors to make sure everything's chill. We host events throughout the year and one week-long event in the Mendocino Woodlands in the summer. We have these overnight conferences where we get our youth and we host a weekend of connection connectivity, spirituality, and interaction that creates a safe space and connection with like-minded individuals. And we just had our summer conference here at your guys' church this weekend, so we hung out 
we had games, we interacted, we connected, and it was great. And our next one is August, no wait, that was this one. I don't know, the next one's in November in San Jose, and I'm not sure where. But if you guys know any youth or UU age 14 or about to be 14 or to 20, you should tell them about our organization because we always love finding more youth. And especially in UU spaces, it can be very difficult to find younger people who are connected with that. So yeah, that's our organization. What? Yruup.org. There we go. Yeah. yeah, 30 youth all in a room and didn't get any sleep. I'm shocked. <laughs> and if you guys fall asleep during the meditation part of the service, we completely understand. Okay. Uh, land, our, our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land and the ancestral people of this land, the Lishan Ohlone peoples. Our church institutions and homes are occupying their ancestral lands. We acknowledge that the lands were stolen from the Ohlone peoples who have had an ancestral relationship with this land, the plants, the animals, and the water for millennia, continuous to this present day. Maloney, Ohlone people are still here. We also recognize that the spirits of Ohlone ancestors are present. We stand in solidarity with all indigenous peoples and their right to self-determination and justice. We commit to working toward healing of the intergenerational trauma, theft, and disposition of Native peoples, and dispossession, dispossession Native peoples continue to face. We celebrate the joyful rematriation and restoration of ancestral lands with local Lishan Ohlone peoples. We encourage you to learn more about the confederated villages of the Lishan Ohlone, Ohlone people. I think we have a slide that may or may not give you a, a link to that work. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, Jody Mathis, member of this congregation and your worship associate for today. And now we will light our chalice. If you know the words and the hand gestures, please feel free to join in. We light this chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism. May it remind us of the divine spark in all of creation, the power of love to heal what is broken and to be grateful for life's blessings each day. We have two other ca candles that we light. First, our peace candle, which we'll light with a reading from Prerna Manchanda from her blog, Technically Spiritual. We live in an extremely fast-paced world. Short takes on Twitter feeds that can make or break careers. Tech updates every week, day, hour. Conflating self-worth with productivity because of how we measure success. Struggling for time to be amongst all the doing that needs getting done. And for people that are concerned about collective well-being, especially in moments of social justice and the fight for systemic equity, we struggle with the tension between obligation and responsibility. It's our individual and collective responsibility to be active citizens fighting for positive change. And we are all more capable of responding instead of reacting, connecting meaningfully instead of shallowly, and making good decisions when we pause and mindfully discern long enough to hear our own inner wisdom. There's a great deal of wisdom and peace we can draw from and productively use when we tune into our inner world and cultivate a deeper awareness. There's a great deal of benefit we can have on the outer world by tuning into our inner world. And may we say together, peace is possible. Next, we light our Black Lives Matter red candle. 
And with this, we lift up the life and work of Bernice Johnson Reagan, who died on July 16th. Activist, composer, singer, and author, she may be best known to us as a founding member of Sweet Honey and the Rock. Speaking of awareness, she said, if every moment is sacred and you are amazed and in awe most of the time when you find yourself breathing and not crazy, then you are in a state of constant thankfulness, worship, and humility. And together we say, Black Lives Matter. Today's service explores the first Unitarian Sangha. I bet some of you members, even longtime members, did not know we had a Sangha. Reverend Laurel didn't when I proposed this service. Uh, it's our monthly meditation group. Our leader, Carol Emmert, and two members, Federico Carrara and Joe Cristofalo, will talk about their meditation journeys. We are happy to introduce you to a church activity that brings its members joy and connection, that gives us an opportunity to grow in a non-judgmental environment where we can find encouragement and teaching for our individual practices and the sweetness of being in group together. You can find meditation practices in many Unitarian Universalist churches. Here is a little about ours. And together we say, come. Let us worship together. Our, we'll now sing our morning gathering song, number 38 in the gray hymnal, Morning Has Broken. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yay. Okay. It's really nice to be here. My name is Carol Emmer, and I've been a member of this church for about 11 years. And one of the really special parts of First Unitarian for me is the meditation group. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the group. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why meditation really makes sense as supportive in the UU path. And then finally, a little bit about kind of a myth uh, that people some, sometimes carry around with them that I can't meditate because they don't fully understand what meditation actually is. And so I'm gonna try to pop that bubble so that you all know that you actually can meditate. And then we're gonna actually meditate a little bit. So that's the agenda for the next few minutes. When I first walked through the doors of UU Oakland 11 years ago, I was looking for a spiritual community that included meditation as a practice. I hadn't been able to find a Buddhist community that was compatible with my rambunctious young son, who's sitting there filming me right now. Um, he's now 19, but he was eight, eight at the time. And um, uh, my cousins in Cleveland had told me their UU church, UU church was family friendly and also had a meditation group. 
So it turns out there was no meditation group here 11 years ago, which surprised me because of the correlation between meditation um, and its complementariness to UUism. But in any event, I quickly joined up with Rick Hecht, who was a longtime member, to start our monthly Sangha. The first meditation Sangha has been meeting at my house ever, ever since, once a month. A little bit about the group. We meet on the third Monday of every month at my home, and now also on Zoom, which started during COVID. And yes, we met every month over Zoom during COVID, and we meditated together. On average, just a few, like six to eight meditators attend in person, another one or two often over Zoom. And there is a Buddhist flavor to our gatherings because my understanding of meditation comes from the Buddhist lens. But people of every meditation background are there and are welcome. Transcendental meditation or mindfulness-based stress reduction, for example, or no particular background, including beginners who want to learn. All are welcome. Each gathering starts with metta prayers of love and kindness. And we'll be doing this metta as part of our embracing meditation to give you a sense for it. We then meditate silently for 40 minutes and then discuss our experiences. Then if we're lucky, Jody has baked a cake to enjoy with some tea or wine. And the cake is important to our strategy of getting people because we'll often get a bigger turnout if I mention it in the subject line of the reminder emails. You know who you are. Many of you only come when cake is in the subject line. So you'll be hearing more about meditation and the Sangha from other members in a little bit. But here's my take on why meditation is so complementary specifically to the UU path. And I'm going to say, then say, talk about um, meditation and um, people's kind of little emotional hurdle uh, to it. So um, I think we're ready for the next slide, please, Emily. Thank you. The theologian Joseph Campbell divided world religions into two categories. Religions of faith, like Christianity, which are relatively rules-based, and religions of wisdom, which are meant to equip practitioners with a personal skill of wise discernment that enables them to make their own wholesome choices. I see Unitarian Universalism, like Buddhism, as a religion of wisdom. This is a place where we support each other on our individual and collective paths towards mm -hmm. anti-racism, social justice, environmental sustainability, equality, and so on. I see meditation as a powerful support to Unitarian Universalism and specifically to activism in two primary ways. One is in helping us ground our worldly work in wholesome motivations like compassion instead of less wholesome motivations like anger or moral superiority. The practice of metta or loving kindness can help us open our hearts to people with whom we disagree. The second is that self-awareness can help us detach from outcomes. It's natural for people who care passionately about an issue like social or environmental justice, very important issues, to be attached to one outcome or another. But the fact is that outcomes are, to a greater or lesser extent, outside of our control. What we do have control over is the cultivation of wholesome attitudes within our own heart minds. It's possible to care deeply about an issue and work very hard towards a certain outcome, while also holding some acceptance around the fact that it may or may not come to pass. And that helps us maintain some kind of center when the worst happens. Approaching our worldly work with a kind, strong but not brittle internal flexibility and emotional self-awareness can help us stay motivated through setbacks and disappointments. And the less we vilify people on the other side of the issue, the less we ourselves suffer the internal pain of feelings like anger, disgust, moral superiority, and ill will directed towards people who, just like us, are the products of arising causes and conditions that are largely outside of their control. Next slide, please, Emily. The greatest misunderstanding I encounter around meditation is the idea that if you can't sit peacefully with an empty mind like this guy, 
you're not doing it right. We all have images in our minds of the Buddha sitting in perfect peace on a lotus bathed in otherworldly light. And I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to over the years who say, I tried to meditate, but I couldn't do it. I kept getting distracted. So that's, uh, that's um, a misunderstanding. The Buddha meditated largely alone in a forest for years to attain a fully enlightened state. He and other monastics then and today practice mindful awareness 24 seven for decades. That's a completely different model from us meditating after work with our heads spinning from the day's ups and downs and more to come tomorrow. So meditation is not about being peaceful. It's an active practice where you're actively constantly discerning. You're not thinking. Um, you are trying to move away from reactivity to stimulus and towards wise responsiveness to stimulus. That's where inner peace comes from. So next slide, please, Emily. So in contrast with the guy on the lotus, this is like a real world distraction that can happen. In the first Unitarian Sangha, we meditate in the real world. This is my dog, Sake, who sometimes barks and pesters people to pet her during our gatherings. Sometimes there is street noise or someone's phone rings from their purse in the other room or a meditator coughs or snores or farts. You know, everything happens. And the next slide, please. Ooh, there should be another one, no? Um, okay, if the other slide isn't there, um, it is meant to say, remember to recognize the present moment's experience. So that's a phrase that maybe you can hold in your heart. Meditation is remembering to recognize the present moment's experience. It's not about being empty, although if you can get to that, um, you know, that's lovely. So the dog barks, your leg aches, you get distracted, and that is all good. That is part of the process. Successful meditation doesn't mean being completely non-reactive. That's a long-term goal. Successful meditation means simply remembering to recognize the present moment's experience. If a dog barks, instead of getting hooked in and carried away by an overwhelming rush of reactions, a wise practice is to remember to recognize what is happening to you in that moment. So here's what that might look like. Here's our case study. A dog barks and you notice uh, physically an intake of breath, muscular tightness, maybe your heart starts to pound a little bit. Emotionally, perhaps irritation arises, perhaps resentment arises, perhaps thought arises. Why does anyone have dogs? My cats never do this to me. I'm never coming to this sangha again. So this would be very natural if a dog has disturbed your peace, right? So you note those as thoughts, but you don't get hooked in and carried away and start looping over and over with these thoughts. And then if you're able to continue to be somewhat present and let all of these thoughts and feelings just be, note them lightly and recognize the next moment's experience, eventually your breath starts to calm, your thoughts start to calm, and you're noticing this, your breathing starts to calm, and once again, you can return to putting your attention on the breath until a thought arises or your nose itches or somebody's phone rings and then it starts all over again. So it's this, it's this cycle um, that, you, that you repeat over and over again. Meditation is a practice, it's not a state. Losing mindful presence is not failure. It's what the human mind does but it can feel like failure because we live in a very linear, goal-oriented culture. The good news is, the more we practice mindful presence, the more stability of mind we experience eventually, and arguably, the more we're able to truly live because we experience more moments of full and authentic presence. As we worship together today, perhaps we can each have some moments of re real-world meditation practice. And so here's some instruction um, for a little, a little meditation right now, just to practice. Um, you may wish to close your eyes if that feels good for you so that you can 
go inward, and then let's truly arrive where we are. Take a breath, feel your bum supported in your chair, whatever that feels like, hard, soft. Feel your feet supported by the earth. Notice that it's comforting to be held, to know that you'll always be held by the mother earth and her stability. Then take an in-breath and notice how it feels. You may notice the feeling mostly inside your nostrils, also out-breath when you need it. <laughs> you may notice the feeling mostly inside your nostrils or under your nose or in your lungs or your diaphragm. Just be present with the sensation of breathing. And as you're present with the sensation of breathing, inevitably something else arises and becomes more dominant in your experience. It may be a sound or thought or physical sensation. And the idea is to note whatever has arisen without overthinking it or getting hooked in. So just note lightly in your head, whatever is dominant right now, warmth, the smell of chalice smoke, boredom, thinking about lunch, which you can note with a value-free word such as sensation or smelling or restless. And then turn your attention back to the anchor of the breath. And then inevitably something else will distract you. And what is that? It will be different most likely because our experiences change from moment to moment and even micro moment to micro moment. So as you start to notice, there are an infinite number of things really that are changing all the time. So now what is dominant in your experience? For me, I'm noticing the effort of managing my voice and my body. I'm noticing the feel of the metal of the device that I'm holding and the wood of the chancel on my wrists. And uh, I might note sensation or hard. I'm also feeling gratitude. I'm also feeling happiness that everybody's here together. So that's the simple practice. You anchor in the breath. Inevitably, you will become distracted. So think of being distracted as part of the meditation instruction instead of a mistake. So you'll lose the thread, and then when consciousness arises again, lightly note whatever it is using a value judgment-free word. Know that it's not failure. It's a step of meditating. And then come back to the breath. When you realize you've lost the thread, if a feeling of judgment or disappointment arises, send yourself some kind compassion for your good intentions and effort, and then return to the breath, and then get distracted, and then consciousness arises. So lightly note the distraction and return to the breath, then get distracted. Presence, humanness, consciousness, kindness, this is the training, this is the practice. So now we'll, um, we'll do another related practice um, as we move to greet each other. So um, sometimes when I've been here and we're moving towards the greeting, tension is arising because I just feel socially anxious and I'm worried somebody is going to reject me or think I'm weird or um, something bad is going to happen. And if that's you too, there's a way to think about this, and I use this frequently in interactions with people, where I think about the truth that we are all the same. We are all the products of our individual arising causes and conditions. We're all like a drop of dew on a leaf hanging over a river. We're all individual. And yet when we fall into the river, we are all the same. And so when we greet each other, we're in the river with 
our brothers and sisters and siblings and cousins. And so if we feel in our hearts this commonality among all beings and all people, it's much easier then to interact with each other because this person isn't really that different from you. They're just a drop from the next branch that fell into the same river. So please greet each other. Buddhitarians too. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, but we never make it to your house because we go to bed early. Uh, but then um, Angela just told me that you start at seven thirty. I thought it was like eight thirty. No, we used to be seven. Oh really? That's yeah. so late. Oh okay. Why did I think it was like anyway? Yeah, that's yeah. cool. She hasn't been because of trouble hearing that. Yeah. Because it's a conversation around the room, but it's yeah. We would make our mind things just as that's happening at different people. Yeah. Everybody is talking. Yeah, so yeah we might do it because, because that's good. We live near the Rockridge Park, which is in Yeah. And we're eight minutes from the Rockridge Park. Yeah, Park. I know what you live off Colby. Yeah. Between yeah. Colby and Climbers. Right. Cool. And you're in this too. I am. That's Oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. What I like is when people think they have to stop their minds, right? And I tell them, you know what, do you stop your blood? You can't yeah. do that, right? Same thing. It's this, it's this widespread misunderstanding. Yeah. So many people I've spoken to. I love it. Like, no. I love teaching people how to meditate. Do it. Yeah. I love teaching people how to meditate. And I'm so bad at it. But maybe if I teach somebody else, they'll be really good at it. <laughs> It's just a question of showing up. I've only been doing it for 30 years. I'm bad at, I'm bad at it if, if good and bad is measured by yeah. keeping your mind. I'm trying to get in late, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, maybe next to Maybe there's much work coming up to me. I know. He takes care of the kids. I know. He does. Okay. Please wander back to your seats. We'll sing hymn 111, Return Again, from the Teal Hymnal.
Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm uh, Federico. I was born in Italy, but uh, I've lived in uh, Oakland for the past uh, 10 years. I've been a member of this meditation group for about two years, and uh, I can say that it has been helpful to help me cultivate my practice and to learn other perspectives, which sometimes might be the most uh, important thing. Um, also, I'm very good at getting off script, so I'm just gonna read <laughs> some of the notes I wrote down. Um, I'm gonna speak about my, my, my practice and where it comes from and how it, it helped me in my life. So my, my father has uh, his own meditation practice and uh, when I was around uh, 10 years old, um, I got really curious and uh, asked, asked him like, what he was doing and if, if he could teach me. So over time, uh, I've gone from following the instruction that I was given to starting to think critically about it and I started to get interested in the type of practices that exist and, uh, and different philosophies. So I, I became kind of compulsive about exploring all the lineages of this and that philosophy. And uh, I have to say that uh, it has been very helpful. Uh, what I've learned is that um, there is a big uh, subjectivity aspect that is generally not very discussed because again, uh, a lineage is gonna focus on certain things. Another lineage is gonna focus on other things. There is a lot in common, but the aspect that I think sometimes is a little undiscussed is the subjectivity part of it. It's, uh, it's quite intuitive if you think about it. We all have different backgrounds, um, different way of seeing life. We decide that this is important, this is not important. And so our minds literally work in a different way. Um, so following uh, a certain meditative practice can work for somebody, but maybe it's not gonna work for, for, for somebody else. So this is just a message I wanted to share that it's good to start uh, from whatever lineage is more compelling, whatever practice is more compelling. Uh, but a, an important aspect for me has been that I, I've been able to make it my own and build my own practice, customized on my own mind and my own needs. So um, I have some time limits and uh, I, I always think about this type of stuff. So I'm just gonna focus on one aspect of this practice and how it, it helps me. Um, but if you want to talk to me later, I have much more to say. Um, so one of the first things that I learned about myself from my practice is that uh, if I'm not intentional about it, I end up living my life on autopilot. Uh, what that means to me is to live life in a reactive way. So if something happens, uh, I engage with uh, my thoughts and feelings as they come and I heavily identify with them. So instead of noticing that anger is coming up, that I feel it in my body, it's coming up, I am angry, I get angry, I engage uh, with, uh, with the whole thing. Um, so it, uh, okay, after all of these years, uh, um, it has improved, um, it has improved a lot, but uh, it might disappoint you to hear that I'm still very reactive. I, I think that uh, there are thousands of years of psychological evolution that we're probably not gonna overwrite with the practice that we do 20 minutes a day or whatever it is. So, and also, if you think about it, it it's likely we would not want to do that. Being completely unreactive to life would maybe take something away from the human experience. So maybe, maybe that's not something we, we would want to do. But uh, what I've learned is, uh, is specifically this thing, is to, is to create uh, a little bit more uh, space uh, between uh, me and my reactions, me and my thoughts and feelings. And what I've learned is that in that space, uh, what I see is just potential. And we all can deal with that potential in a, in a different way, again, depending on our own mind and the way we want to deal with that potential. 
but it's empowering. And uh, I think in that potential, we, we can find uh, um, a way to just be the person we want to be and try to live life uh, the way we think it's best. Thank you. And now we have Carol with our embracing meditation. But And before we get into our embracing meditation, I ask that you hold the family and friends of Murshid Kiran Rana in your hearts, especially his wife, Jeannie. Kiran, a dear member of our community, passed away last week after battling aggressive cancer. Kiran and his beloved Jeannie blessed this community by singing with us in the choir, by leading their Sufi Kavali services, and with inspirational presence and teachings. We were lucky to have Kieran sing his songs of longing and belonging with us. Before embracing meditation today, we're going to start with a Buddhist practice um, called metta, which is translated as loving kindness. Do we have this slide, Emily? There we go. So this is considered a prayer. It's also a meditation. I have done retreats as long as two weeks where I just say these phrases of loving kindness to other beings uh, constantly in my waking hours. Um, and what I love about this is that it feels like prayer, but it doesn't involve any higher power. Um, so it just involves us and our hearts and our collectivity, if we're saying it together, our great intentions and our well wishes for other beings. So in embracing meditation, we lift up individuals. Um, and you may use these phrases if they're speaking to you or do the regular embracing meditation. But I thought we might start by saying this metta prayer for all beings. And the way we'll start is this is the practice. You feel into your heart center and you feel, you may wish to close your eyes. You feel the energy that's there. There might be warmth, there might be fluttering. You might have a sensation of a flower blooming or a flame burning, or vibration. And this force of our love is always with us, although we don't tap into it a lot, most of us. So tap into your love and your desire for the well-being of all. And then we'll, we'll say these phrases together. You can also say these phrases for any individual. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe and free from harm. May all beings be strong and healthy. May all beings find peace and ease in their lives. And now let's do the, the regular embracing meditation. You may lift up your loved ones. And now Joe Cristofolo will give us his reflection. 
Joe is one of the longest time members, I think, of the Sangha. He's been coming regularly for 11 years. Good morning. I've been meditating since college, so that's quite a few decades. When I learned TM, or Transcendental Meditation, the most prevalent form around at the time. I was hoping meditation would help with anxiety, but there was also a lot of talk about reaching enlightenment, and that sounded good too. I've had ups and downs in regularity, but mostly stayed consistent. Uh, meditation was pretty hard to come by, actually, while raising kids, uh, but mostly stayed consistent. About 10 years ago, there was an uptick in my practice. I shifted from meditating with a mantra to vipassana, or breath meditation, after reading John Kabat-Zinn's Full Catastrophe Living. Zinn founded a meditation research center at the University of Massachusetts and has a variety of meditation apps that I was, was able to plug into. The next boost was from uh, here, here in church from former church member Rick Hecht, who was an MD at UCSF, and his area was research on yoga and meditation. He brought in Mushim, a very affable monk from the East Bay Meditation Center here in Oakland, um, who had studied Buddhism in Korea. Uh, by the way, the East Bay Meditation Center is a radically inclusive, multicultural, multiracial group in downtown just like us. So the Star King room was full to capacity, and Vente Hall was circled by people doing the funny-looking walking meditation around the perimeter of Star King. Since Carol started the current Sangha about 10 years ago, I have felt a boost to my daily practice and meditated daily with very few exceptions. Carol is very experienced, as you can see from, from what she said today, um, and has had her own teacher for years. She lovingly leads us, including talking about Buddhist ideals of compassion and opening up your heart. So here's a real story about compassion. Early on, I had mentioned to Carol that I had difficulty breathing through one side of my nose, and sometimes, uh, which sometimes created anxiety during meditation, and it also created sleep issues for me. Meditation is, of course, all about the breath. Noticing a thought, reaction, emotion, or physical sensation, and gently returning your attention to your breath over and over. She suggested some one-on-one -on -one time before Sangha one evening. When I was breathing through the more restricted side of my nose, she suggested just being present with that, generally the last thing I would want to do. It was helpful and calming just to sit with what is and as I did this for some minutes, I got more settled with it. It was after that session that I had the presence of mind to see an ENT who diagnosed I had a severely deviated septum bone in the air passage way. Um, and surgery was revelatory, being able to breathe with spacious calm on both sides. The session with Carol, her presence, helped me to get clarity on what I needed, and this was deeply moving. And you're always going to get ongoing gratitude for that. If you're considering coming to the Sangha, you should also know that afterward, Carol serves tea and sometimes something alcoholic, which all seems okay. And Jody quite reliably brings a cake she made that day. Incredible. <clears throat> I feel very fortunate meditation has been a constant in my life. It has quieted my system down broadly, and it, it is a reliable go-to if I have some particular anxiety going on. Meditation has been described as helping you become more yourself. 
I'm also interested in neurophysiology through my work. And uh, the neurophysiological basis for this, for meditation being effective, is well documented. And find me later if you would like more detail about that. And I even have a little bit of a handout about the neurophysiology part. So thank you, Carol, everyone, for all our kind and soothing long meditations over the years, as well as the sweet social time, fun conversation, and self-disclosure that always follows. May our practice succeed in promoting our being our better natures more and more. Please join us in singing hymn number 1009, med Meditation on Breathing. There's another practice in Buddhism that we're going to talk about right now, which is uh, another extremely valuable day-to-day -day practice that you can adopt. It's really just a mindset. And it's called dana, D-A-N-A, um, and it is translated as the word generosity. So in the West, we have an arguably to some extent unwholesome relationship with money, um, especially perhaps in the United States. It's really, we kind of feel like it's ours and we deserve it and giving it can be hard. And so dana is a spiritual practice where everything is okay because you're using wise discernment to kind of figure out your relationship to giving and also how much to give. So it's not about social pressure. It's not about um, uh, being a good person unless you take that as a goal. Uh, and so the, the way the process works is you think of giving as an opportunity. Uh, dana is considered of benefit more to the giver than to the recipient because giving is such a wholesome thing to do and it generates good karma but it also feels fantastic. It's a wonderful source of happiness if, if we can let kind of our, our greed get out of the way. <laughs> so uh, you think about how much do I have to give? And you know, I need to take care of myself. We all have to pay for, for a lot of things. And if the answer is zero, then the right thing to do is to give nothing. Um, if you have a lot to give, uh, then you can feel into that and you can think about what feels, what feels great, what would feel great to give that I can just give with an open heart. Um, and you can also use it as a stretch practice where you're saying, oh, that feels like a little too much. Do I wanna, do I wanna actually stretch my dana practice and my spirituality and give more than feels entirely comfortable and then see what that feels like. So it's all your own practice, there's no right or wrong, you can give something or nothing, but you get to use it as an opportunity for self-exploration and um, feeling into your mind, heart, wallet. So that's the practice and um, we will now begin the offertory.
I'd like to point out that our ushers are also members of the Sangha. And please join us in saying the words of congregational commitment that are on the screen. To the work of the church, which is weaving a tapestry of love we call community, we dedicate ourselves and these our offerings. Please join us for one last hymn. The words should be familiar to you. And as Joe extinguishes the chalice, we end with this ben benediction from Thich Nhat Hanh describing another way to recognize the present moment's experience. In our daily life, very often our body is there, but our mind is not there. Our mind can get lost in the past, in the future, in our worries and anxieties and fear. Our breath is something like a bridge linking body and mind. And as soon as you go back to your breath and breathing in and out mindfully, you bring your body and mind together again. And there you are again, fully alive. And if you really are there fully alive, you have a chance to touch life in that moment, the wonders of life in that moment. May you find ways that work for you to feel fully alive, to touch life and the wonders of life. May you be well. Thank you. Thank you.